Good morning. Welcome to the online service of St Matthew's Church in Warsaw. My name is Ben. I'll be leading the service this morning. A couple of very quick notices for you. The Bible course started this week. It takes place on Wednesday evenings at 7.30pm. If you are interested in joining, please email Joe. His email can be found on the church website and it's curate at stmatthewswarsall.co.uk. As has been mentioned in previous weeks, our in-person services have paused for the time being, but we look forward to meeting together once the risk has reduced. We will keep you informed via our email bulletin, our social media, media channels and notices in online services like this one. Welcome. We want to focus on God and to worship him. As we do that, we find that we are united as family with all of God's children. So whether you regularly attend St Matthew's Church or not, please feel free to say hello uh, in the, the chat, the live chat. And if you, if you want to do this uh, and you're not sure how to do it, if you're watching on Sunday morning, there should be a small icon labelled live chat underneath the video on your device. It's next door to the like and dislike buttons. This morning we are on the fourth week of our series on the book of Daniel. Next week is uh, the last week we're in that book. And as with previous weeks, the passage we look at today might make you say, how bizarre. But we're grateful that Reverend Joe will be helping explain things to us. So let's get straight in to our, our time together. Please feel free as we go through this service to join in with the prayers, the songs, any words that are on the screen in bold type. And if you're feeling like a bit of morning aerobics, uh, Reverend Jim will lead us in an action song shortly. It is all worship to God. Shall we begin with a prayer? Our God and Heavenly Father, we bring ourselves before you and ask you to help us to worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for your kindness and goodness, and we ask that you would always help us to see more clearly what a glorious God you are. We thank you for our brothers and sisters worshiping you all across the world, especially for those we would normally see at St Matthew's. And we ask that you would bring us together again soon. Amen.
This week we are learning about a lady called Esther. Esther was beautiful and chosen by the king to be his new queen. She did not tell the king that she was Jewish and followed God. One day the king planned to kill all the Jewish people. Esther was afraid. God's people were in danger. Esther prayed and made a plan to save God's people. She prepared a feast and invited the king. At the feast Esther was brave and told the king that she followed God. She told him not to kill the Jewish people and the king listened to her. God's people were safe. This week in the children's section, we are looking at making and icing biscuits. You could even make a feast for your household. This week we have been looking at the story of Esther. Esther made a feast and invited the king and Haman to come round. Esther used the time to talk to the king and ask for a favour. She wanted to keep all of the Jews safe. Why don't you use this time whilst eating your own feast to share with your household and enjoy time talking with them? Let us pray. Father God, thank you for fresh starts and new beginnings. Thank you for being our light and for walking beside us every day. Help us to be brave like Esther and listen to your plans for our lives. We are sorry for the mistakes we made yesterday and the things we did wrong. Help us to learn, play and share together so that the wonderful world you have made becomes more beautiful every day. Amen.
As we saw the snow blanket the world in pure white recently, I wonder if you were reminded of God's forgiveness. In Psalm chapter 51 verse 7, it says, Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let us admit to God the sin which always confronts us. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. The week just ended included Holocaust Memorial Day, a day designated for the remembrance of not only the World War II Holocaust against the Jewish people, but also later genocides, such as those in Rwanda and Bosnia. It could justifiably also include more recent atrocities, such as we have seen in Iraq, Syria and Yemen, where we find the death tolls equally horrifying and inexplicable. All lives matter in the sight of God, and we pray that such violence may be consigned to the past. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We are all desperate to see COVID-19 consigned to the past, although there is as yet little evidence that that will soon be the case. Not only will the final death toll be appallingly high, but also the side effects will be far-reaching and will change life irrevocably for many people. We ask God for strength and endurance to withstand the worst effects of this scourge of our times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we continue our detailed look at the book of Daniel, help us to reflect on your presence in our lives and on your steadfastness when we turn to you. Whilst we are thankful when our prayers are answered positively, Please help us to see your purpose for us when they are not. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us look forward in hope. More and more of us are receiving some protection against COVID-19. The days are lengthening and the first spring flowers are in bloom all reasons to thank God for the beauty of our planet and to renew our resolve to make the best of life during the restrictions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Collect for today. God of heaven, you send the gospel to the ends of the earth and your messengers to every nation. Send your Holy Spirit to transform us by the good news of everlasting life. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
a prayer to discern God's vision for St Matthew's. Father God, who set the world in motion, you inspired our predecessors to build St Matthew's Church as a symbol of Christian faith on the skyline of Walsall. You guided them to teach, serve and proclaim your kingdom of love in words and actions to the people of this town. As we seek to discern your direction for us for the next stage of the journey, may your Holy Spirit guide those in leadership at this church. Open our hearts to your call on our lives, both as individuals and as the church. Help us to see the world through your eyes and proclaim your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us say the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.
in our commitment to follow Jesus, it's really important that our choices are aligned with our devotion to God. We all make sacrifices of our time, our money and skills, and some portion of these are given as our offering to God. And some of our time, money and skills, we sacrifice in other directions. It is good to regularly reflect individually on how our own skills, money and time are distributed and what that shows about our priorities. Over recent months, many of us have been unable to give to God's kingdom in the ways that we did before the pandemic. So take some time to consider how you might be able to give in a new or different way, both to St Matthew's Church and perhaps more broadly. It has been really wonderful to see the innovation and commitment of God's people as, as they have adapted to the changes we've seen over the past year or so. Lord God, we thank you for the money, time and skills that you have blessed us with. Help us to prioritise the way we use, spend and sacrifice these gifts, showing that you are our highest priority. We pray that all that is given to the church would be used effectively to help build your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 12, starting at verse 19. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarrelling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod wearing his royal robes sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give him praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second Bible reading is taken from Daniel, chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, 4 to 8, and 17 to 30. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed round his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. 
your majesty. The Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendour. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed round his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Daniel 5. Uh, what a weird and mysterious story. We've got a wild party. We've got a, a spooky disembodied hand. We've got Daniel, who by this point seems to have become a little bit of a forgotten legend within Babylon. And we've got the death of a king. It's a very relatable story, you know, I think it really closely mirrors my life and I'm certain that you can see yourself firmly in the middle of this scenario. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. The, the story is bizarre. Even by the book of Daniel's standards, it is bizarre. But it does have a lot to say to us here in our 21st century lives, as I'm sure it has all of its readers throughout history. Um, I think that to get to the, the kernel of truth within this story, we have to put a little bit more flesh on the bones. As with all of the biblical stories, we are only seeing a snippet of what's going on. When we have a little bit more context, the text itself is brought to life. So, who's ready for a little bit of Babylonian Regency history and lineage? It's only a little bit. I promise. In our reading, we meet a king called Belshazzar. He's the guy throwing the party. And of course, in our reading, we hear that Belshazzar's father is King Nebuchadnezzar, the only king that we've, we've heard about up to this point in the book of Daniel, and the one who, who took Daniel and his friends into captivity, and uh, the guy who built the giant statue and all of that. Now, it's not actually true that they were father and son. The word uh, rendered as father can actually mean predecessor. 
So when Nebuchadnezzar is described as Belshazzar's father, it really just means that Nebuchadnezzar was the king before him. Now, here's where it all gets just a little bit of Game of Thrones. Nebuchadnezzar had a long reign of 43 years, and then he died. And after this, his son, wait for it, Evil Meridak, that's his name, uh, became king. And with a name like that, you just know that he, he wasn't a good guy. His reign was so chaotic that after only two years, his brother-in-law, Neriglassar, who we also hear about in, in Jeremiah, his brother-in-law assassinated him. And Neriglassar must have done a decent job after this because he ruled until he died of natural causes. And he was succeeded by his son, who we will call Timmy. And Timmy was, was only a child, and he was only king for nine months before he was beaten to death by a gang of conspirators. And the conspirators appointed one of their own, uh, Nabonidus, uh, to be the king. And he remained the king until Cyrus the Great of Persia took over the country. After three years of being king, Nabonidus appointed our guy Belshazzar as co-king while he went off and, and fought the armies of the Medes and the Persians. And now here we are. Belshazzar is king, or co-king, co-regent, and he is living it up while his other co-king is off fighting their enemies. So... From this, we can see that Belshazzar is actually quite far removed from Nebuchadnezzar, and it would seem that he governs a, a culturally very different Babylon to, to the one in which Daniel arrived and the one in which Nebuchadnezzar found his realisation of the one true God, or you might describe it as his conversion. And so to paraphrase Tolkien, some things that should never have been forgotten were lost. History became legend, legend became myth, and for five generations of kings, Daniel and the one true God passed out of all knowledge, until, as if by chance, the Queen Mother remembered Daniel. The one true God had always been there. Even Daniel had been there this whole time, probably in retirement. But the king and the culture seemed to have become so far removed from the truth that led to Nebuchadnezzar's acknowledgement of the one true God, again possibly his conversion, that they turned to worshipping finite things and, and things that fade. Or perhaps they were so wrapped up in their own lives and, and caught up in the party that it was as if they were worshipping their own wealth and their own prosperity, even in the presence of holy symbols of the one true God. Now, before we go further, it's time for just a little bit more flesh on the bones of the story. Co-King Nabonidus is off fighting the Persians and the Medes. And Co-King Belshazzar, as we know, is living to excess. And he's not humbled himself like Nebuchadnezzar did, like Daniel tells him. He hasn't acknowledged that God is God and that he is, in fact, just a human. In fact, actually, the armies of the Medes and the Persians are right at the gate. They're right there. And what is the king doing? He's called in all the nobles and all of the leaders, and they are having a massive party. It seems that Belshazzar is in complete denial, or he's completely blind to the imminent danger. There are a few possible reasons that I can think of to explain Belshazzar's state, and there are three things that I think, realistically, we might find that we reflect in some way in, in our lives too. First, and honestly I think least likely, is that Belshazzar is so confident that the city gates will hold and that his co-king uh, will fight off the invaders. Uh, he need not worry, so he carries on living as if nothing is wrong. You know, they've got it sorted, it's their job, not mine. He's almost completely washed his hands of all responsibility. We know that in life, every member has to play his part. If a person in society 
manages to get through by just reaping the rewards and not putting in the work, they get found out and, and usually there's consequences. I think that this is, is the flip side of the coin of St. Paul's metaphor of the body as well. While no part of the body can look down on the work of another, it's also true that when one part of the body uh, stops doing their job or, or becomes complacent, the whole body starts to fail. The heart can't decide that, you know, the eye, wow, the eye, you've got vision covered, you don't need any help, because the eye will fail if it stops pumping blood to it. The, the stomach can't decide that, you know, the brain's got everything under control, then just leave it to it. The stomach needs to constantly digest and prepare, prepare nutrients and provide information so that the brain can do its work. Now, I don't want to labour this metaphor, but perhaps it was complacency that led Belshazzar to his, his revelry in the face of imminent danger. There are many in our world who think that church and Christianity is just about our gathered worship on a Sunday morning, and everything else is outside of our remit, or it's someone else's job. You know, there, there are Christians who would argue this as well. We don't need to concern ourselves with feeding the hungry. No, the food banks, they've got that sorted, it's fine. We don't even need to think about homelessness because the council have put a roof over everyone's head. Problem solved. We don't need to think about climate crisis because that's a global government issue. You know, we could go on and on and on. And in reality, all of these things and our responses to them are what form our worship and our discipleship. Perhaps Belshazzar didn't follow the faith of Nebuchadnezzar because he thought it was someone else's job. The priests, the astrologers, the magicians, etc. They've got it covered with their sacrifices and whatnot, so I'll just live to excess. That's fine. Okay, another thought. Perhaps Belshazzar was so wrapped up in his own life that he couldn't see what was going on around him, or if we were being a little harsher, we might say that perhaps he didn't care what was going on around him. Perhaps the events of his life had blinded him to the needs of the world. Perhaps he got so caught up in maintaining his, uh, his status and his lavish lifestyle that news of wars and, and devastation rang hollow in his ears. Or even the imminent destruction of his kingdom couldn't open his eyes to see. It all sounds very dramatic, and it is very dramatic, but this also uh, is something that, that touches our lives every day, especially now in a time of lockdown when even the smallest hurdle can feel like an absolute mountain to climb. How easy is it for, for our problems and our insecurities to, to pile up and to obscure our vision and obscure our perspective? Sometimes in our world, status and wealth feel like the pinnacle for which we should all be striving. And there's nothing inherently wrong with having status and wealth, but when they prevent us from seeing the needs around us, you know, when they become our idols, that's when something has gone very, very wrong. The call of the one true God is one of adoption into a family. And when we know that we are adopted into that family, the only status that we need is as a beloved child of God. And when we know that we are loved, we are to let the world know that they are loved too. And to do that requires that we walk alongside them in life, join in their joy and join in their suffering, and assure them and demonstrate to them the hope that is a transforming and restorative power of Jesus. We don't pretend that our own problems and difficulties don't exist or, or vanish, uh, because they don't. But we do know that we have a God who gives us the strength to face our problems and who builds a community in which we can find comfort.
We don't need to let our problems obscure our vision because we know that we've got a God in whom we can trust. And we also know that there is a community out there who needs to know that God too. One last possibility, and I think that this is the most plausible one. Belshazzar knew the oncoming danger. He, he saw it and he realised that there was nothing that he could do. The threat was too big for him to do anything, so he shut his eyes and he pretended it wasn't there. How easy of a trap this is to fall into. I do this all the time. If there's a job that I don't want to do, I'll pretend it doesn't exist. But it always comes back to bite me because the job doesn't just disappear. It remains there, normally getting worse and worse or closer and closer. And the next thing I know, uh, I've either got twice the work to do or half the time to do it. Sometimes it's fairly trivial things like assignments or cleaning the dishes. But sometimes they're things that are actually more critical like befriending my lonely neighbour, which for someone like me with, with introvert tendencies can actually be quite a scary thing. Or, or, or something like speaking out against something that you see in society that you know just can't be fair and can't be just. It takes a lot of courage to, to stand up and be counted. The courage of Black Lives Matter protesters, the courage of uh, women's rights movements and the suffragettes, the courage of of Hong Kong democracy protesters, environmental protesters, student marches and all sorts and kinds. They all knew the consequences and still stood up for what they knew was right. They knew that they couldn't affect the change by themselves, but they still stood up and were counted. And we can take courage in our God, the God who gave fearful Moses a companion in Aaron, the God who who through the, the reflections of Paul tells us that, you know, we, we do not have a spirit of fear, but one of power, love and discipline. The God who, who tells us that even our smallest acts of faith lead to great things. Or from, from Moses' Moses's parting address, be strong and bold, have no fear or dread, because it, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. This is the end of the line for, for Belshazzar and you know the end of the Chaldean reign over Babylon. The Persians and the Medes breached the gate and took over the city. Belshazzar is killed on the very same night and Darius the Mede is appointed as king. The writing on the wall and, and Daniel's interpretation wasn't a word of warning for Belshazzar, it was a final verdict. But it serves as a message of hope for every generation afterwards who read the story. For us, the message tells us of a God who forgives, a God who loves and a God who helps us in our ongoing transformation into Christ likeness and calls us out of our old selves into our new selves, to put away the old self and to put on Christ. It's a message that says we're not bound to the norms of our society. We're not bound to status and wealth. We're not bound to fear or anxiety. We are free to face the challenges of life with a spirit of humility and the knowledge of the love of our God, creator, redeemer and sustainer. Amen. Now let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today. We're going to finish with these words. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. As usual, after this service, there will be a chance to connect together and, and chat with others through a, a Zoom call. The link is available in the live chat below uh, or it is on the email bulletin and Facebook post about this service. We will continue to keep sending out information through our usual channels, including email and social media. So keep your eyes peeled and we hope to see you again before too long. See you next week. Bye for now.